Um, uh, at the end, I'll talk a, a, a tiny bit about accounting. Uh, there's, I think, some relevant work there, but my experience mainly is in management organization. So today I'm going to talk to you about how pragmatism can help to produce more impactful research in management and organization. And so just a, a bit of context. Uh, so management organization really simply said could be about how to achieve things with people, because more normally we talk about management organization when a group of people is trying to achieve something together. And pragmatism is one of the alternative paradigms to the dominant positivist and constructivist research paradigms. It's really focused on practical consequences and human problem solving, and it's a complete philosophy. So there's theories of learning, ethics, communication, sociality, meaning, uh, and many more. And what's really special about pragmatism is that that impact uh, is really important to it. Uh, and of course, yeah, a lot of critique of mainstream research is that it's irrelevant to practice that it doesn't help practitioners do a better job in practice. And therefore, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do work that's relevant for practice, that has an impact. Um, and so who am I? Uh, well, as, as you've pointed out, I'm assistant professor for strategic management. So I mainly teach the strategic uh, management courses, uh, but also uh, teach especially sustainability topics, say sustainable strategy at the Amsterdam campus of Northumbria. So the Amsterdam campus is focused on sustainability. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate at Warwick Business School with Professor Davidina Colini. I've uh, passed my viva. Uh, I'm currently doing the corrections, so kind of like the last version for the library. So there's some uh, some small things I need to change. Uh, I'm also a research fellow uh, at Innovation North with uh, Professor Tima Bonzal, uh, a very important uh, sustainability scholar. Uh, I founded some time ago uh, my own consultancy, Innovasis, uh, advising companies on innovation and sustainability. The research topics I work on are organization design, sustainability, and pragmatism. And my motivation is designing better organizations and then in brackets for the environment, because I think also the environment is very important to consider in these things. Um, and so what's pragmatism? Um, and I think one way to understand pragmatism is through the pragmatic maxim. There's different ways of, of, of putting that into words. Uh, I like this one uh, at the moment by Peirce. So what he says is to a certain the meaning of an intellectual conception. So say any kind of theory and a kind of concept that you use. One should consider what practical consequences might result from the truth of that conception. And the sum of these consequences constitute the entire meaning of the conception. I know this is not maybe the easiest to understand. Um, so what he's trying to say here is that basically say if we have a new idea, if we have a new theory, if we have a new concept, we need to try to figure out what are the practical consequences of this. And pragmatism is basically focused on this, be that on learning, be that on ethics, be that on meaning making. It's always about this idea, what's the practical consequence of these things that we're talking about? And then trying to test for that, trying to better improve performance in that say. Uh, and like I said, pragmatism is a philosophy. Uh, so there's uh, many uh, theories, many books, many articles written on, on, on pragmatism. Um, but in my work, I focus on the classical pragmatists. Uh, and these are uh, in order also on the pictures, Charles Sander Peirce, William James, John Dewey, George Herbert Mead, Mary Parker Follett, and Jane Addams. You could also add other people, but these are the main uh, people that I work with. Uh, and I really focus on the classical pragmatism because there's also other kinds of pragmatism. And just some well-known concepts of pragmatism are, say, for example, the win-win situation. That's actually a term coined by Follett, uh, who uh, used to study next to uh, Harvard. Uh, the feedback loop of Dewey, uh, very important for learning. Uh, the train of thought by James, uh, the concept of abduction by Peirce. So they have really done some uh, quite some fundamental work that's also very relevant for management and organization. And to understand a bit where pragmatism comes from, you need to understand that historically speaking, it was inspired by Darwin's theory of evolution. So where Darwin tried to explain how species change, uh, pragmatism basically tries to understand how humans change, not just humans individual, but humans really as, as societies, as, as groups of people. And this uh, uh, pragmatist philosophy emerged around the turn of the 19th and 20th century in the USA. So that was a, an era, um, era uh, uh, really, um, yeah, right after the Civil War. Uh, so reconstruction was really important. It was very dynamic times, a lot of dynamic changes, a lot of uncertainty. 
and the argument is that in that sense, uh, there's a lot of similarity to today. Okay, we don't, we're not necessarily uh, post civil war, but these are very dynamic times. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of technological changes and how to deal with situations like that. So pragmatism is argued to offer novel ways of thinking and acting under dynamic and uncertain conditions. And I think a lot of organizations, a lot of managers are facing that. And here, hopefully, pragmatism can help. So what can pragmatism look like in management organization? So one, uh, the, just a couple of uh, famous uh, theories that are that are relevant uh, to, to management organization that took inspiration from pragmatism. That's on the one hand, uh, Weick's work on sense making, on organizing as a process. Uh, Schoen's work on reflection and action that really took uh, key ideas from Dewey. Freeman's uh, stakeholder theory, of course, very important uh, today. Uh, that was inspired by Dewey and followed. Uh, Bloomer's work on symbolic interactionism uh, uh, that uh, owes a lot to meet, uh, and Simpson's work on practice theory that, of course, draws on, on, on uh, 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 yeah, a, a bigger number of, uh, of pragmatist scholars. And so, again, why is pragmatism relevant? Uh, like I said, so uh, pragmatism is supposed to be uh, able to deal with uncertainty, complexity, and dynamics, and especially the social aspects. Social aspects like how do you uh, do research together with practitioners, but also social aspects of how do you include stakeholders, wider stakeholders in the research process. Like I said, pragmatism is an alternative paradigm for research, uh, an alternative to the dominant uh, constructivist and positive it was uh, once. Um, and because uh, uh, impact and problem solving is so central to pragmatism, it's really pragmatism aims to, to achieve these practical solutions. And that really makes it distinct from, uh, from other kinds of paradigms. And so what is pragmatism, actually? Uh, I'll just go through some of the principles of pragmatism, but of course, uh, there's a lot more to it. Um, one aspect is fallibilism. Uh, and it's, it's maybe easier to understand what fallibilism is by talking about verificationism. And so verificationism is, of course, you, you try to find what is true, but usually the, what, what is true is supposed to be true tomorrow, in a year, in a thousand years, uh, uh, so for a longer time. And what pragmatism basically says is, okay, what is true today doesn't have true be tr uh, true to be uh, doesn't have to be true tomorrow anymore. So just because something has worked in the past doesn't mean that it will work in the future. Um, and so what pragmatism tries to do is, instead of trying to verify and validate the way that other approaches tend to do, it's really trying to falsify. It's trying to falsify old knowledge, and it's also trying to falsify, okay. Does this idea, does this experiment, does this new way of working that we came up with, does it really work? Let's try to not make it uh, uh, right, but try to, to see how, how it breaks apart, if it breaks apart, and learn from that. Um, another aspect and that relates to this fallibilism is that it's anti-foundational. So what practice basically says is there's no foundational knowledge that we can just accept. We have to be ready to doubt everything. Uh, so all knowledge has to be up for refutation, but, and that's really important, it doesn't mean that you have to doubt everything all the time because then you could never be actually actually be able to do anything. Um, another thing that's really important for pragmatism is experimentalism. So trying to draw out the practical consequences of your idea, trying things in practice and see, does it work, does it not work? And that means that uh, pragmatist experiments are in situ in a life situation and in vivo in a life situation. Um, uh, and that's, of course, quite different from, say, the lab experiment that we know from uh, other kinds of research. And pragmatism is in inherently relational. So pragmatism sees the work as inherently connected. And that is, again, maybe better understood when we try to oppose it with uh, substantivism, kind of like the opposite perspective. In substantivism, it's the world is made up of distinct entities with distinct essential characteristics. And so in pragmatism, you know, uh, uh, you are you are more interested in trying to understand the relationships, not just about between people, but also between things, between you and, 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 and the things out there. Uh, and yet the, uh, pragmatism is more interested in trying to understand these relationships and how they change than just trying to see things for themselves. I know maybe it's a bit philosophical, but we can talk about it later in the Q&A. And so what does that mean for research design? So first and foremost is that you co-design your research with practitioners, which is really something that other approaches uh, seldom do. So where most approaches start with theory and then go to, uh, to collect data and then go back to theory, what does the data mean? 
Um, pragmatism starts with practice and ends with practice. So uh, you have a practical situation that is in some way problematic, that 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 is 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 not what what the practitioners would like. You uh, go back to theory, try to better understand this practical situation. Uh, you generate ideas for collecting data, for 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 experimenting, and then you interpret the the the, the results of the experiment again through theory. And from that, derive again, okay, what does that mean for practice? So it starts in this practical situation and uh, uh, the process only ends with performance, when things actually are better than they were before. Uh, what that also means is that uh, this kind of research design has to be uh, able to change. So flexibility and adaptability is really important. And you have to design research for iterative cycles. You try again and again and practice what works, what doesn't work. Uh, uh, and that really uh, uh, drives the process forward. Regarding data collection, one of the big struggles is uh, access to problematic situations. So really situations where practitioners, where people in practice don't know how to go on anymore. And one reason is really simple, because most people do not like to. <laughs> really talk about when things are getting really tricky and they're really difficult. They don't know what to, uh, what to do anymore. But that's really where pragmatism, so to say, shines. Uh, pragmatism is less interested in situations where things uh, already work, but it's more trying to understand situations where things do not work. And because of this situated approach of pragmatism, context really matters. Uh, uh, it's not just about things separate from the rest, but it's really about trying to understand the whole situation what's really going on in this organization, what's really uh, going on in this group, and trying to dig deeper. And that means that we move, move away from the literal meaning of data as something given to captor as something taken. So in a way, you should almost say it's not data collection, it's captor collection. Um, because pragmatism requires active exploration. You're trying to better understand, okay, what's going on this, in this situation. So you don't just collect data and then analyze it, but you continuously try to really explore, okay, what's going on? It's almost a, a bit more like your, your Sherlock Holmes uh, and Watson trying to understand well, what the heck's going on here. Um, and then the next thing, so this is a bit more tricky to understand maybe, it's this anti-realist stance of pragmatism. So what pragmatism means with that is that facts are only facts within the specific inquiry you are engaging in. Uh, another way to put this is that we need meaningful data. Uh, we need to have data that is meaningful, but we need, also need data that gives meaning, that we can understand, that we can do something with. So in pragmatism, it's not just about collecting more and more data, more data is better, but it's really about, okay, it has to be useful data. And so in that sense, uh, this is also something quite different from other stances, is uh, pragmatism uh, does not uh, separate facts from values. And that's something uh, tricky to understand, and we can also again uh, talk about that later. Um, and like I said before, so data collection has to be iterative uh, with analysis happening throughout. And then for analysis and interpretation, uh, analysis has to happen with the practitioners together. Uh, we together have to try to understand, okay, what's meaningful here? What does that actually mean? The emergent insights have to feed back in the ongoing research process. That's why data collection and interpretation have to be uh, at the same time, so to say. Um, and like I said, the interpretation as well has to happen with the practitioners together. The key really is to re-narrate the past, the present, and the future in novel and meaningful ways. So what that means is that, say, uh, you are in a situation, things don't go as as any as they did before, so in the past, so we have to re-narrate. So what has changed between the past and now? And what does that mean for the future? And it's kind of like this past, present, future, and then re-narrating that really leads to new insights. And the other thing is that you have to discuss uh, uh, the outcomes and the practical implications with the practitioners as well. You have to involve them in that process. And then lastly, go where the data leads you. So instead of collecting data and then analyzing it, again, like I said before, data collection, data analysis, they cannot be split. And then the other point, of course, today is uh, what is impact? Because uh, uh, the question was kind of like how how to make more impactful research. And of course, there are quite different perspectives on impact. Uh, so uh, one way to measure impact that already existed for a longer time is impact factor. So the idea is the more an article and a journal get cited, the higher the impact factor is. But that, of course, doesn't mean that you've had actual impact in practice. So when I'm talking about impact, I don't mean impact factor. Um, other articles, they start counting how often 
uh, their research is being mentioned in practitioner media. So are there newspaper articles? Are this is the social media? Are you liking their post? Are you commenting on the post, etc.? But I also think that doesn't really mean that you've really uh, had practice. It just means that maybe people engage a bit with your work. And uh, another perspective of impact is a bit sort of say this, build it and they will come. It's this idea that we just need to do really good research and then people will come and, 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 and use our stuff. And that's, of course, is a hope. But I think, and that's my argument, I think very seldom is it really about did I make a practical change in practice? Did I improve the situation? I think that's really the key questions that we need to ask as researchers. And a lot of times the argument is that impact takes a long time. And I, I question that and ask, okay, but what actually takes long? If it's just, if impact is just about time, then, well, maybe we don't have to worry because then uh, the, the impact will just emerge over time. But of course, there's a lot of uh, research being done that doesn't end up having impact. So we need to better understand why does impact or why do we think that impact takes so long? And um, I want to talk about three perspectives on impact, translation, co-creation, and this performative uh, um, uh, or practice perspective on impact. And translation could be uh, talked about, uh, seen as, uh, say, something like a Harvard Business Review, huh? uh, where it kind of the assumption is uh, that the knowledge already is good and useful, we just need to translate it. So that's why Harvard Business Review, they take articles that have been published and they rewrite them in a way that are more, more accessible for, say, managers. And this means that the research can continue the way it is, because translation is essentially separate from the research. And the question is, how does this translation feed back into, into the research? How does practice feed back into the research? And this is sort of say what, what, uh, what uh, I'm quite critical of, uh, but also co-creation is quite critical of. So co-creation is a different way to have impact. And that is really doing research together with practitioners. Uh, so say here in the picture, you see there's a lot of people here uh, involved that are in some way engaging with some kind of tool, some kind of object, uh, trying to give feedback, et cetera. And most often this focus on co-creating uh, often something that is a, a kind of tool for the ongoing research. But the argument is that co-creation still is quite separate from the actual ongoing practice. You know, the people that you see in the picture, they don't work there. Um, they don't live there in that building. Um, so all too often, it's actually about situations that are quite distant from the actual moment where you're co-creating um, because people meet outside of the actual practice situation. Um, and so what happens all too often with co-creation is that it's not really implemented, it's not really tested if it works. Uh, you have this tool, you've used this tool, and then the question is, okay, but so what do we do with this? And an alternative would be performativity. So this pragmatist approach where we learn through changing reality and that's really distinct, and, and I'll get back to that in a, in a second. And in this perspective, uh, impact becomes a journey where you learn along the process what is actually impactful, what's actually the problem, what's actually the solution. Impact becomes about changes in practice, changes in how we do things. And impact becomes about improving problematic situations in the concrete, not just as an idea, oh, we could try this, or we could try that. No, you have to show in practice this is better than what was there before. And what it also means is that we as researchers are as much impacted as the practitioners. It's not just about the practitioners changing their practice. But it's also about us researchers changing the theory and the practice. And so examples of that would be the Hull House in Chicago. So this is uh, on the picture is uh, Jane Adams. And she really tried uh, to figure out together with other people, okay, how can we improve the situation of immigrants? How can we improve the situation of children in poorer neighborhoods? And she, she experimented with that in practice in the actual uh, neighborhoods where people were living. Another example would be the laboratory school by John Dewey in Chicago. Uh, both of them, of course, are, are very close acquaintances, uh, where John Dewey tried out his uh, theories for education, what, what, how, uh, and, and if they actually improve education. And so what's the problem with impact? Um, and, and why do we need other kind of research? So on the one hand, it's this rising complexity. Things are much more interrelated uh, as, than they were before. They get much more complex, and that requires that we find ways to deal with this complexity. Also, things are getting much more dynamic. You know, uh, say something like COVID, uh, uh, the situation around uh, Russia and Ukraine, 
uh, there's like so many uh, uh, things happening now all at the same time. So sometimes people talk about the poly crisis, crisis on crisis on crisis on crisis. How do we do with that? Um, another problem is that a lot of research is done retrospectively. So after someone solved the problem, then you go back and try to understand, okay, what was actually going on here? But what, what uh, pragmatism is trying to argue, no, uh, if you really want to solve problems, if you really don't want to do impactful, meaningful research, it can't be retrospective. You have to engage with problems as they occur and trying to solve them. That is the real proof, so to say, uh, of, of what actually works and what doesn't. And not too often uh, that research is done separate from practice, uh, that uh, uh, once practitioners look at the research that, that was done by researchers, that they think, okay, so who cares about this? Who needs this? Why is this actually really a problem that's actually relevant for practice? And this, of course, is a bit what pragmatism is arguing against. And one of the key things here is that if you want to deal with the dynamic environment, that means that you need to uh, uh, move away from trying to create stable ways of organizing, stable ways of managing, to much more dynamic ways of organizing and managing. And that's why uh, things like, say, Agile, Scrum, uh, Holacracy, et cetera, is so much on the rise because uh, companies are seeing, okay, uh, this, the, the times are changing so quickly, we need to be able to also change internally uh, as quickly, maybe even quicker. And one issue here is epistemology. And I'll, I'll just quickly talk about this. I know it's, it's philosophy stuff, so it's, it's not always easy to understand. And epistemology, very simply said, could be about how we learn about reality. So in a way, it's something that we engage in every day. And uh, uh, what most epistemologies are talking about is representational epistemology which builds on a correspondence theory of truth. What you're basically trying to do is you're trying to mirror reality out there in some way through numbers, through models, etc. And what this means is that you try to learn about reality without changing it. And that is really important to understand. Most research is not trying to create change. It's trying to not change things so that you can do good supposedly research. And I argue that impact is diametrically opposite to this correspondence theory of truth. If you want to have impact, you need to change things. And when you change things, it can't be about correspondence anymore. Um, another topic is rigor. Uh, you have to follow a method to the T. You have to be very exact about how to follow, the uh, follow this method. Um, and this is very inflexible when you try to adapt to emergent insights that emerge during the process. So, for example, if you thought about uh, something as a problem and then you learn in the process actually something else is the problem, you need to change your, the way you do your research. But a lot of uh, uh, existing ways of doing research have trouble with, with, with these kind of changes. And another uh, aspect is that uh, this idea that uh, knowledge is eternal. We're trying to find these uh, these uh, truths uh, that basically uh, should be uh, uh, held forever. Um, uh, but the argument is that uh, if the environment and the situation keeps changing, what has worked yesterday doesn't mean that it works today or tomorrow. That's why you have to be constantly so vigilant to test things out in practice, what actually works and what doesn't work. So what's the solution? Um, so one way is to studying into the future, and that's maybe a bit difficult to understand. So what I'm trying to say with that is you try to engage with problematic situations and you try to act forward. You do things and see what comes out of them. And that gives you a way to sort of say better understand, okay, how how does it actually work in practice that you work on, 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 and go towards the future in your in your work? Uh, studying with practitioners, so really this co-inquiry that involves practitioners, and studying much closer to the perspective of, of uh, practitioners, so focusing on performance, focusing on performativity, focusing on actual problematic situations, and not be too far away from, from practice. And this brings us to the performative epistemology of pragmatism which builds on the pragmatic theory of truth. True is what has the practical consequences that you want. We learn about reality by changing it. So we're not mirroring reality, we're changing reality. And this also requires a processual ontology and epistemology. That means reality is ever changing. It doesn't hold still. And learning unfolds over time. So because uh, uh, we try to try things out in, in practice, uh, uh, things go differently than, than we expected. We learn over time. 
and there's some methodological consequences for impact. So, uh, like I tried to say, uh, oh, sorry, forget the word organization design here. So, this kind of research starts with doubtful situations, not predefined problems. Um, so, what actually is the problem? So, the act of problematizing the situation is vital to establish doubt in existing ways of working. You want to change the situation, and to change the situation, you need to start doubting what led to the situation that you're facing now. Um, you need to involve stakeholders uh, in co-designing the research. Change comes from changing behavior, not just things. So you can't just expect the organization to, to uh, work differently because you change the organization of chart or you change the standard operating procedures or you change the routines that people use. Uh, ex experimentation in the exercise situation becomes very central. Uh, so it's, it's this uh, testing for the practical um, uh, consequences. And uh, what's really important for impact is that the impact itself, what you think is impactful, re-enters the research process as insights that can guide the further process. So you work in this iterative way where you learn new things and that decides, okay, what should we do next? And then again, you need to discuss impact with practitioners, what changed in their practice. That's really the key thing here. So practical impact means making practical differences in prop uh, problematic situations, differences that 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 make a difference, that are positive in some way. Um, and uh, it's really about change in practices. So it's not just about changing tools, but also how and if they are used. Uh, so it's a bit of a of an, a large understanding of what tools actually are. And like I said, it's only finished when the change really has happened. Uh, so you can't just have an idea uh, and then say, oh, well, now we're finished. The situation must have been transformed so that practitioners know what to do now, so that they can also deal with the problem in the future. So my proposal is take an explicit stance regarding ontology and epistemology and choose your methodology in line with these. So really make a conscious choice. Do I want to use pragmatism? And if I want to use pragmatism, what does that mean for my ontology? What does it mean for my epistemology? What does that mean for my methodology? Uh, this is really about research through impact. So impact is not separate, but basically uh, you, you generate good research by having impact. So it kind of like flips around what, what research actually is. And in a performative onto epistemology, where we learn by changing reality. Uh, like I said, uh, you co-design the research with practitioners. Uh, and it's really about this uh, pragmatic through a uh, truth by changing uh, uh, by, by, through through creating these experiments in it with practice and then impacting as an emerging process. So what does it look like in practice? So one example would be Case van Kuyk, who uh, developed a design strategy for redesigning processes in an organization. And what he basically asks is, how can I design an organization process that develops a radical innovation capability within a technology firm? And so we done for his work on a visual storytelling toolkit, a way to engage employees with their organization's vision. And what you try to do there is integrating visual storytelling in the way of working of a strategy consultant. And so, for example, so what Case did is he engaged in experiments uh, together with, uh, with the company, and he tried to create uh, this uh, canvas that you see here. Um, uh, and participants used this canvas to explore radical innovation opportunities. But what the canvas actually also did is it, it, it created a kind of experimental space that stimulated collective reflection and action and moments to find new ways of working. So basically what it did is it, it created these moments that allowed people to kind of like reflect, hey, how, how, how should we do things? Uh, how is it different from how we did things before? And in this example, it, it was crazy because I think for three months, the student tried to get the company to do this experiment once. And it was really difficult to get them convinced. And the moment they've done this once, they were like, okay, we want to do it again. We don't want to, like, we want to do it 15 times. This was so good. So it took a long time to get them to actually do one experiment. And then, you know, he was almost done with his graduation. So he couldn't really uh, test them us. But, but this company was really excited about the, this kind of new way of working that, that, they, uh, that they hadn't experienced before. Another example is this visual storytelling toolkit. It's kind of, like I said, it's a, it's a way of engaging uh, employees with uh, the vision of a company. And again, here, it's kind of like an, an experiment where they try to uh, engage leadership with an established vision. And the task was to use this toolkit to design a workshop. Basically, it's, it's uh, uh, consultants 
changing their way of working to change the way of working of a company. Um, and so also here, uh, what, what we basically did is we did an experiment where we created a bit more space than normally to work in a different way for them to reflect on what's going on. And they, again, they enjoyed it so much that that they uh, felt like, okay, we need to integrate this in our, our way of working because this is so different from how they are uh, used themselves to, to change their own organization and also the client's organizations. And this is something I did in, in my own work, uh, in my own PhD. Uh, we labeled this as a workshop in a box. So the client wanted a workshop on how to design metrics for a service. Uh, so this is not the actual um, uh, graphic. I, I was not allowed to use that. And the workshop itself was a kind of experiment. So changing the way of working together with metrics and what it combined, it, it combined the actual design of new met metrics, but also redesigning on the spot how to design metrics. So it's kind of like meta in that way. And what happened there is, uh, uh, these are just some reflections of, of, of the people involved in this process. Articulating this has helped me interpret and deal with complexity in the client, client organization. It has helped me for, uh, look for new clues I find it also really useful to, for account management more broadly. Uh, another one, I think the workshop format turned out to be perfect format for doing a small contained prototype of organizational change. It was very insightful to see the change in priorities and values among the participants as the object of design rather than the workshop or its concrete output. And lastly, not being actively aware of the organizational dynamics of the environment we're trying to deliver into is like flying blind. Pragmatist design ethnography really helps the team to respond to the evolving situation and take appropriate action. So just a bit what that actually looks like in practice. There, of course, are some challenges and some critiques of pragmatism. And uh, one really important uh, um, challenge is politics and power. And that's why uh, um, uh, pragmatism has also been a really important uh, philosophy for education and for democracy, especially deliberative democracy. A lot of those, those ideas are from pragmatism. Um, and one of the key the challenges there is that people are unwilling to question their existing, their received knowledge, beliefs, and habits. So, so what they would say is, well, this is always how we've done things, and that's, therefore, why should we change it? Yeah, but you are facing a problem. And it's very likely that how you have done things in the past is part of the problem. And so you really need to design experiments to falsify, uh, falsify this existing knowledge, to show people what you thought has worked, doesn't work anymore and create space for doubting the current ways of working. There are, of course, other approaches, say, engaged scholarship, extra research, appreciative inquiry. So uh, you should also look into these. But I think what uh, pragmatism offers is the theoretical and practical resources really for how to create lasting behavior change of groups in ways that are quite distinct from these other approaches. Um, I also, like I said, wanted to quickly talk about accounting. So I, I'm not an expert on, on accounting, uh, but uh, my colleague, uh, Philippe Lurino, uh, uh, who I think was there uh, some time ago to present his work, he is an, uh, an expert on accounting. And I think there's two articles, uh, uh, these two, uh, where he uh, develops um, pragmatist uh, approaches to accounting that, that should be uh, relevant and interesting here. And I think it says some future directions for um, for uh, pragmatism, and that's really this developing of inquiry habits. So kind of like developing of methods for pragmatist research. So I really like this quote by Barbara Simpson. It requires adventurous inquirers to dive in, explore more of what pragmatism may have to offer. Uh, so really trying to find new ways of, of doing research uh, in a pragmatist way. So some key takeaways, start and end your research in practice. It's really about improving practical situations that have been in some way problematic. Co-design your research with practitioners from the start until the end. Impact as productive change of practice and impact becomes a key performance indicator for research. So in a way, it's kind of like flips around that good research has impact. Uh, and therefore, that will have impact and be impacted by research. Thank you. It's great to hear about pragmatism, how it can really help the organizations for sure, right, Professor? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I said it, it's great how pragmatism is it's helping um, indeed the organizations to do the step up, right, into their in their beliefs, in their 
in their in their uh, um, the way that they're doing the things, and there can be challenge anyway. So, I have I have a question, but uh, before I do my question, I would like to pass my word in here to the advisors. So, Professor uh, Doctor Goyadomari and Professor Doctor Otavio. So, the order is yours, please. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> the first one, please. Uh, we know that pragmatism does not have uh, unanimous acceptance. Yeah. Uh, either it has a philosophical code, current or research methodology. In, in this context, how have your works been received by the European academic community? Wow. Um, so actually, the, the first article ever wrote uh, was a methodology article about how to do pragmatist research. And I was a bit naive back then because I was the whole time while I was writing this thinking, why is this so difficult? Is research always this difficult? I just didn't know. And uh, so this first article, uh, I sent it in somewhere for publication and, and they, OK, I had to make some small changes, but that, but they liked it. They published it. I was like, whoa, they wait, published. wait, what's happening? I, I, I yeah, I, I didn't expect that to happen necessarily. Um, so I think it, it actually has has been very, very positively received um, because uh, pragmatism rests on very strong foundations. There, like I said, there's a, a, a deep philosophy behind it. There's a, there's a, a defensible ontology, defens a defensible epistemology, defensible methodology, def a defensible axiology. Um, so yeah, you, you see things differently than most people. Um, but because it is so defensible, uh, uh, it, it is getting getting reception. But the other point is, it allows you to do things that are becoming increasingly important and that other research approaches are struggling with, and that's impact. So in Europe, at least, uh, I don't know how it's in Brazil, but in Europe, at least, impact is becoming a very, very important factor. Uh, and one way is to get funding. Uh, because there's less funding for research, so we need to depend more on companies to actually engage us in research. And every research project I've done so far, I've done with a company. I've never done it without because I was like, well, like if if it's if I'm not studying a problem that's relevant to practice, what am I doing here? Um, so it has allowed me to engage with companies in ways that I think a lot other researchers are struggling with. Um, and through that, it allows us also often to get third stream funding that depends on funding for practice. So what we do is uh, we get, say, uh, a million from a company, and then the government will also put a million money in that same research project. So that's how, at least in, in, in the Netherlands, and I think also in Germany, I'm not sure about the UK right now, uh, how, how this has been working. And then in that sense, pragmatism is super interesting because uh, uh, also the, the governments, they increasingly require us to work with practitioners in our research. And that's why it's so, uh, so, so, yeah, so interesting and relevant to, to engage with pragmatism. But like I said, it's not easy. I want to say okay. that. Okay, I have another uh, question. Uh, uh, the philosopher Susan Hack has shown some sympathy for the use of intuition as a research method. What do yeah. you think about this? Yeah, I think intuition is absolutely part of, of pragmatism. Uh, and I think related to intuition, the role of imagination. I think that's that's the, this this integration of intuition and imagination in research and giving abduction, the creative element of research, uh, a, a more distinct role. The re-narration, narration being also a creative device, uh, 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 is, is really critical. And so I think in that sense, intuition is really important, but the pragmatist challenge then also is, what's the practical consequence? One thing is being creative and being intuitive. Another thing is, okay, show that this actually works in practice. And it has to be both. So it's not just about, you know, dreaming uh, wild and, and having intuitive thoughts and uh, being creative and being imaginative. It's also about getting your hands dirty and showing that, that whatever you came up with works in practice. Uh, 
And so like just one example, um, this this last example of my own work, the designers that I was working with, they're still using what I what we developed together because it has worked in practice. And they what they now do is so when they when they get a new project, they 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 uh, block budget from the project to do this kind of work with the client because they felt this is working. And I think that's that's from a practice perspective, that's what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I hope that was a good answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Yodomari. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Fridjot, for your amazing lecture. I think he, we, we, we are learning a lot about the pragmatism. And, and as you said, uh, changing the behaviors in your, in your lecture, you said that changing behaviors is the key point. Yeah? So yeah. Uh, uh, to, to, to change this kind of behavior as researchers, uh, as you said, uh, to, to receive funds now in Europe is the, the, the main point is uh, the impact. Yeah? So uh, yeah. uh, what, what, in your view, what the, the, the changes that are necessary uh, to change, <laughs> um, to, to, to transform our behavior as researcher, because we are sometimes interested in publishing journals with high impact, etc. Uh, uh, and, and as you said, you are not achieving the interest of practitioners, because we are not publishing in a, in a right language that the uh, practitioners read. So, uh, uh, we, we understand in, in our program that he, the production of knowledge is the same, but the, the, the liver of content is, is, uh, uh, has two, two sides. Delivering uh, knowledge, useful knowledge to academics, and delivering useful knowledge to the practitioners. So, uh, uh, yeah. in, uh, how, how the uh, uh, European academic community is changing in, in, in trying to to achieve more impact. Could you you talk about a little about this, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it relates a bit again what what I talked about before. Um, so a lot of researchers in Europe are now struggling to get the funds that they used to get for the kind of theory driven research that they used to do. Um, and uh, like I said, one, one way out of that is to integrate the, the impact and the research more. Um, there is actually an, another argument that I think is relevant here, and that is uh, through doing impactful research, through doing research with practitioners, you generate really interesting data. And you generate really interesting data that maybe elsewhere you wouldn't have been able to find. So in this sense, by being sort of say at the cutting edge of practice and theory at the same time, makes it that you could do theoretically and practically relevant research. But that is super difficult because you need to be really at the cutting edge of both. That means you need not just to really understand the theory uh, in depth, to really understand, okay, where is the cutting edge, but you also need to find the practitioners that are working on that cutting edge. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a, a big, big difficulty. But I also, in my experience, I see that it, it kind of comes together. So you, you start finding the people that are also cutting edge in practice if you just ask the right questions, uh, uh, are joining the right events, et cetera. Um, so I think this this idea that we can do more impactful research that also is theoretically relevant, I think that that is a really exciting um, uh, prospect. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, thank you. Uh, um, I, I think we we uh, we are we are seeing some some researchers, particular critical researchers like. Uh, you and, and Lorino and, and for example, Alveson, eh? they, they are talking about the problematization, something like that. So uh, uh, our program, I, uh, we, we, our students, PhD students are professionals that are working in, in, in the field. So they are in, involved in, in solving problems. And so in, in, in particularly, I think we are, we have an advantage 
because our PhD and master students are involved in, in doing doing things in, in, in the reality. So uh, as researcher, <clears throat> as you said, collabor collaboration is, is the key. Né? Uh, uh, so <clears throat> uh, uh, co-creation of knowledge, something like that, uh, and that's some of your ideas we are trying to, to implement. You know? In the essence, our program is professional design. So our, our uh, target, our audience is composed by, by professionals. So uh, academics and, 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 and practitioners uh, and transforming the practitioners in academics. <laughs> so that's not yeah, our, yeah, our, it's our about both. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank we you. we have other other professors uh, together, all, us and of course students and practitioners. So feel free free to to ask uh, Professor Fridjot. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious about the questions. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I I will kick off with one, then I can open the yes. audiences as well, because um. I'm I'm one of the the learner on on pragmatism as well, and and you you professor you have seated uh, Professor Felipe Lorino that we were pleased yeah. to have to have him as part of one of your conference a couple of years, I think two years ago or something something like this, and one of his area that I put in my my note here one of his area and he said that is important for pragmatism is investigation and the inquiry process. So yeah. we learned that uh, pragmatism is not subject experience, but really a full social experience. And also yeah. we learned that the inquiry process transform. We have this very nice uh, graphic, right? An indetermined situation to a reunified one. So here's like my question um, based on your your experience in your studies. Uh, I'm one of the PhD students and just finished my PhD a um, month ago. <laughs> and we yeah. use a lot, and I was very, very pleased to use and to learn to use pragmatism into the, the organization. So how's your experience in Europe? Does the companies like understand and use, um, really understand how to use like uh, the pragmatism as part of as daily challenges process yeah or do you think this is a really under you know a beginning process as we are yeah. all learning every single day yeah um so that there's there's two answers so one is do they understand the philosophy and all the theory and and, and the ontology epistemology all of that no do they have to no <laughs> um what what they're interested in is performance and what pragmatism, I think, can deliver is performance, performance. things that work and things that work better. Um, and when when they see performance, they like that. That's why that's I think this example is, is so is so interesting where um, so with with case, um, the first example I gave you, it, it took him months to get this company to do one experiment to once try to do something else. And afterwards, they were so excited about it. They wanted, can, can we do it five times, 10 times, 15 times? Let's do it much more. And he was like, well, I told you, forever. Like once they, 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 they experienced it, it, it gives them something that they find interesting. But getting over that first hurdle is so, so, so tricky. Uh, with the, example, the second example uh, uh, by Zoe. So um, this was... Uh, a way for this strategy consultant to really fundamentally question what does what does it actually mean to be a strategy consultant? What what does our approach offer that other approaches do not? And so these people they have been working together for years as strategy consultants. And in that meeting that she designed, where she designed the experiment, they suddenly asked questions, questioned assumptions that they never had done before, and all of that in just one meeting. Just by by a clever design of okay, how can we get people to reflect and to start doubting and become more aware of this is how we work, and isn't there maybe a, a better way? And then this last example in in my own PhD, uh, where uh, like I said, so the, this this design agency that they're, they're using this now because they they found it so so exciting. And 
what really happened is so a lot of times because i'm i'm an organization scholar they are designers so they are about you know making a nice service uh, making nice products etc and so they were engaging with the client organization and a lot of times they were they were trying to understand the people like like the psychologists oh this person is like this and that person is like that and was telling them but no 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 you're forgetting the organization it's not about this person it's about whose boss is the, who's the boss of that person who's the boss of the boss of that person uh, uh, who has which interest uh, uh, in that organization and so they they started to get a new appreciation of this organization understanding it much more as a system instead of individual people um, and so uh, in in my experience it, it has worked uh, really well but you need to get across this first bump of of trying to to get them once to try something in practice because they are so afraid to try things and i'm like i keep, I keep telling them that you you try new things all the time in a way yeah no one can tell you that that things will work beforehand uh, so don't try to to take best practice and implement it here because all too often that fails try to really understand okay what's not working about the situation and from that, try to understand, OK, so what could be a solution then? So spend more time on trying to problematize instead of trying to find solutions. Because if you find solutions to problems that don't exist, what good is it? That's great. Um, we are very excited about this, this topic. So every, yes. <laughs> especially the professors that they teach us in, uh, during the, the course. <laughs> so we have seven yep. minutes left. I would like just to open to the audience here to get this great opportunity in asking uh, Professor Wegner uh, questions. Um, feel free, please. Professor Domari, Sorry. Professor Otavio, we're good? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think he, <clears throat> I, I would like to ask you, uh, Professor, about, for example, uh, Toaldo PhD uh, dissertation, use uh, some data using uh, that he used the machine learning uh, to 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 find the factors that caused scrap in a in a manufacturing company. So yep. and after he used the the inquiry process to to find out some some cause. So, uh, uh, what do you think about, for example, mixing machine learning and and uh, and uh, and, and pragmatism yeah. process and inquiry process? What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Actually, uh, there are links between pragmatism and AI, um, especially around the concept of abduction, uh, because abduction is uh, a concept invented by Peirce to describe where new ideas come from, basically. Um, so I'm I'm actually uh, uh, yeah very interested in AI uh, 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 the role of abduction in AI and how to combine that with with inquiry. Um, uh, as far as I have very little knowledge of AI and, and algorithms, um, uh, that's really like a next topic I would like to engage in. But I think what's really important to understand is that uh, a lot of times the algorithms that we design their performance deteriorates because the situation. Uh, that existed when 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 we designed the the algorithm the, based on the data that that we had is not the same anymore. The situation changes, and how mm. to deal with these kind of dynamics and this kind of complexity and how to better understand that. I think that that is really very interesting for pragmatism to engage in. But like I said, I'm I'm not an expert on this, and this is really something that I would like to to work on in the future. Yeah, yeah, great. Yes, I think. Lastly, uh, Professor, uh, I'm sorry, Professor Yadomari, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, 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 the performance aspect, I think, uh, join join researchers and practitioners, then, uh, because uh, of course the organizations are interested in improving performance. So, uh, um, yeah. as you said, uh, pragmatism is, I think, it is the best approach because we they are uh, pragmatism defend that we are interested in in providing better solutions for the problems. So uh, uh, I, I think uh, I, I like, of course, <laughs> like you and Otavio and, and, and Toaldo and, and many other colleagues that are interested in applying 
the method, the, the, uh, the pragmatism, because uh, fortunately for us, I think uh, the, the academic community is, is interested in, in developing this kind of research. So thank you, thank yeah. you, Professor Wagner. Um, Thanks for, a lot. For your amazing lecture. Yeah. It was. And Indeed. again, if, if you have any questions, please reach out because I, I would love to help anybody who's engaged with with pragmatism and trying to uh, to make it perform. Thank you. Before we Thank leave, you. Professor, if you allow me, yes. uh, your your material was so so powerful. Can you share the presentation with us, if it's I can. possible? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. I need to add some Thank references you so much, and, and, and take something out, yep. but I can. Yeah. Thank you Good. so much. Thank indeed. you. So at this moment, we are closing the event. Really appreciate it for everybody that took your time to discuss with Professor Wagner today and wish you a good day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank bye you bye. all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.